Hello again. Today we're going to talk about institutions, the underlying determinants of economic growth. What do we mean by institutions? Well, institutions are quite complex, but I think of the best way to think about them is rules. Okay, rules that govern human interaction, whether we're looking at formal rules, such as state, federal, government laws and regulations, or informal customs, habits, expectations. Things are taboo, things are socially unacceptable, uh, picking your nose in public, to use a, uh, a trite example. There's many layers of institutions, there are many sources of institutions, some of them we're aware of, some of them we might not be so aware of. The important thing about institutions, though, related to economics, is that institutions govern incentives. The structure of laws, the structure of rules that govern our interactions with others, determines our incentives to engage in particular kinds of economic activity. Institutions govern incentives. Or we can uh, state this in a slightly different way. We can say if you change the rules, you're going to change the results. You change the rules that govern the economy, you're going to change the expected results that you'll see based on people's actions. Okay. And basically, it comes down to if the incentive structure in an economy rewards people being productive, people being innovative, people applying the scarce land, labor, and capital in the most productive ways, well, then you'll probably have more growth and more prosperity in that economy than if you have incentives that don't reward innovation and work and growth and the development of capital. So it's kind of a simple concept, but all the institutional framework can be very deep and complex. And what we'll do today is look at a whole bunch of different elements of the institutional structure and basically how they operate. And then um, I'll show you some examples of institutional differences across countries that explain um, observed differences in economic results. Okay, let's get right into the most important of all institutions, which is property rights. The market economy, sometimes referred to as capitalism, I think market economy is a little more apt term, basically is defined as an economy based on individual ownership of the means of production, otherwise known as private property and capital, or you could say resources, land, um, natural resources, capital would be things like buildings, equipment, tools, vehicles, factories, okay. Yeah, uh, even labor, because in a truly free market economy, people own themselves. You should note here that even if you're not a landowner, even if you don't have capital, even if you don't have a lot of assets, in a sense, we're all capitalists or we're all owners of means of production in that we start off owning ourselves as free people. And in a market economy, in a capitalist economy, the decisions about the use of these resources is, by and large, going to be based on the decisions of the owners of the resources. So as landowners, we decide, what am I going to use my land for? Am I going to grow crops on it? Am I going to build houses on it? Am I going to build a building on it? Our equipment, if I have a fleet of trucks, what am I going to haul in them? Where am I going to use them for? Am I going to sell them? Am I going to rent them? Okay, am I going to have my own business? As um, free citizens, how am I going to use my labor services, my physical labor services or my mental services that I can uh, develop and acquire? And guided in all of these choices in the market system by the market process, which we've talked so much about in Unit 1, responding to prices seeking profit opportunities. The key thing about pri property rights and private ownership of the means of production and resources, it means that resource owners have incentives, very strong incentives in a functional market economy, to maximize the economic value of the resources. Why? Because resource owners get to keep the profit that accrues from um, profitable use of the resources. Okay. So they have automatic incentives built in to use these resources in the most profitable ways. And remember, we interpret profit as the creation of value because we're uh, taking a bundle of resource inputs, we're taking land, labor, and capital inputs and combining them and rearranging them and producing something new and then selling that product for a higher price, Okay, it's got a higher market value than the pre-existing values, the pre-existing prices of the resources individually. Okay, so private ownership of all resources gives the owners uh, the most incentive to, to use those resources in profitable ways because they can keep the profits. And therefore we also have incentives to invest in increasing the long-term value of resources, which we call capital formation. Remember, capital is key. It's capital, baby. Capital is key to growth. Well, capital is not going to happen. Capital formation is not going to happen so much unless people have incentives to create capital. Okay? And we'll see this happen with uh, physical property, uh, with land. People will improve land. Farmers will 
cut down uh, trees and weeds and they'll clear swamps and they'll invest in increasing the fertility of their soil for a long period of time. Um, we'll see it happen with labor. Workers, people, citizens will educate themselves. That's probably what most of you are all about right now, taking classes at Ball State. You're getting some education, you're investing in your human capital, um, you spend maybe two or four years in an educational program that increases the long-term value of your human resource. Okay? So you can be a more effective contributor to the economic production for the next 30 or 40 years. Okay? If you didn't get to keep the extra pay you got from being um, a more skilled, more educated worker, would you make that investment? Well, no, you'd have a much weaker incentive to do that. So ownership of the individual ownership and then individual reward is what's so crucial towards uh, maximizing the value of resources and creating incentives for capital formation. It all, it all hinges on property rights. So back to the definition of uh, capitalism or the market economy just for a minute. Remember this is private ownership of the means of production. Most importantly, and this is what the economists have emphasized, Without private ownership, I mean, forget about the incentives aspect for a moment. Without private ownership, there actually can't even be an economy. There can there can actually be no markets. There's no trade, no prices, and no markets. Um, no private property. There's no feedback mechanism and no value creation because entrepreneurs and resource owners don't have any guidance on how to use their resources. This was pointed out probably most famously by the great uh, economist Ludwig von Mises, who was an Austrian economist. He's actually a student of Karl Menger, and he later taught in uh, New York University, um, and he escaped uh, Europe in 1940 because uh, he was actually chased out by the Nazis. But anyway, von Mises uh, criticized socialism, which is the absence of private property in the economic um, state of affairs early on in the early 1900s and uh, he says economic calculation which we would call profit and loss accounting can only take place by means of money prices established in the market for production of goods in a society resting on private property and the means of production okay Mises is saying if you don't have private property you don't have market prices and therefore you don't have economic calculation you don't have the profit and loss mechanism giving feedback giving information giving um, motivation to the entrepreneurs so you're going to be groping in the dark economically without a foundation of private property in the means of production or all resources in the economy and let me um, kind of do schematically let's think through this schematically I'll go back to this chart I have for unit one which talks about how the the basic market process and you'll remember that it starts with trade trade is mutually beneficial trade makes both parties better off Okay. And when we add in money, now we're just kind of assuming the existence of money. You can take my class on monetary policy if you want to talk about the origin and, uh, and the kind of evolution of money. It's a very fascinating topic in my opinion. Uh, we'll talk about money actually and inflation and whatnot a little bit in this course. But We have money in trade. That means we have prices. We have money prices for all goods. And with money prices for all goods, entrepreneurs can compare the value of the output against the opportunity cost of the inputs which is known as profit and loss accounting this is what von Mises referred to there in that quote as economic calculation you'll notice that is based on having prices for goods prices for goods is based on trade okay? and with profit and loss of course we get the positive feedback of profits the negative feedback we get that dual feedback loop that I talked about so much in unit one and that is really where growth ultimately will come from that's really where value creation, I should say, comes from in the short run. Growth we'll talk about is based on capital and, and technological innovation as well in the long run. But I want you to notice something very crucial here. Okay? We just assume that people have the ability to trade. But what gives you the ability to trade the resources you own? It is the ownership itself. Okay? So we have to actually add one step to this process, something that we took for granted before. But now since we're talking about institutions, we're going to make this explicit. You have to have property rights as the foundation for trade and prices. With no individual ownership, there actually is no trade and there is no prices. Then there is no market process giving the feedback okay, and giving the information and providing the incentives for entrepreneurs to do their thing. And we shouldn't forget here, we should we want to remember the, to populate this world with the entrepreneurs and I like to draw them 
you might recall as the eye on the prices looking for those economic opportunities that are revealed by the price differential between the the price of value of the final good and the price or the value opportunity cost of the resource inputs. Now a classic example, and I won't talk much about this because I'm going to have you read an excellent article by our own Professor Van Cott on, on this example, but we are um, we have an intriguing example, something we call a natural experiment, of two economies that are actually similar in all other respects, similar in their basic endowment of natural and human resources, but made a critical shift of their institutional structure and we can see the result actually we can literally see the result we can look at these countries from space and we can see the difference in economic development that the, the radically different institutional structure brings about of course i'm referring to the difference between north and south korea okay now again i won't belabor this too much because you'll be reading about it in uh, professor van Kott's article but what is north korea north korea is a is one of the last remaining pure socialist economies and socialism basically means in contradistinction to capitalism you have collective actually government ownership they call it collective let's call it what it actually is government ownership and management of all resources or most and and in particular the land and the capital okay so the buildings the machinery uh, and the land itself is owned and managed by the government elites, the uh, the communist dictators. So we have government ownership slash management of, I'll just say land slash capital. Actually, to a large extent, labor as well, because uh, citizens in North Korea do not have the individual freedom to accept or reject jobs, to move about the country, uh, to invest in their own human capital formation. Okay, it's, this is what it means to, to not have a free country. The human freedom is an important thing, but the ownership, the lack of private individual ownership of land and capital is also critical. Okay. So you have collective ownership and management of land, labor, and capital. What's it called when uh, you don't own your own labor and somebody else owns it and somebody else can tell you what to do even if you don't want to? That's right. It's called slavery. Okay, so we might as well call it that. They have uh, government ownership and management of land, labor, and capital. Um, Therefore, well, even if you uh, attributed the noblest of intentions to the communist dictators, okay, and if you know anything about the North Korean regime, they have they that's not true at all. They're just some uh, petty, greedy, just tyrants. Uh, but even if they did actually mean well for their people, um, without private ownership, you have no prices, you have no markets. Okay. You have no feedback for people who own these resources to tell them what is the best use of your resource right now. Okay. What crops should you be growing on your farmland? Or should your land even be farmland? Should you build houses on it? Should you build a factory on it? Should you build a highway on it? You have no guidance on those decisions. Or very minimal guidance because you're lacking prices. Whereas in a market economy or a capitalist economy, and this is South Korea, a, a broadly speaking a capitalist or market oriented economy which means that they generally have private individual ownership of the factors of production land in particular labor they have labor freedom the individuals are free to accept reject jobs they can quit jobs they don't like they can move about the country they can move out of the country land is generally privately owned and managed the farmers get to make their own decisions about what crops they grow, how much fertilizer they use, if they want to change uh, land use from growing crops to building houses or building stores or that kind of thing. And probably most importantly, capital. The factories, okay, the stores, the offices are owned and managed by individual owners, often through companies. Um, but companies are people too, as a famous uh, politician said. Okay. Companies are interested in maximizing profits, and they will follow the price signals. Okay. They will listen to the market and make decisions and change their actions on the basis of what the market tells them. Okay. And that's what generally describes South Korea. Now, there's no perfect capitalist economy. There's no perfect socialist economy. But as far as a natural experiment, this is about as close as you'll ever see. And 
the results are very striking. South Korea has a real GDP somewhere north of $30,000 per person. South Korea is a vibrant and bustling place. Uh, they rank highly on all the um, development indicators, life expectancy, infant mortality, um, and the standard of living there isn't much different from the United States. So, yeah, the U.S. has a 50000 per capita, real per capita GDP. South Korea is 30000 That's on the same order of magnitude. And if you go to South Korea, you'll see the uh, Seoul. Look at the, and you can just tell here by looking at this map. Look at the lights. Okay, it's a vibrant city. Every city and all the little towns in the countryside, um, they're electrified. Okay, people own, people have electricity. They own appliances. Um, they have internet. They have TV. Okay. They produce lots of consumer goods and they trade with the entire world. You're probably familiar with some of the South Korean products and South Korean companies, Hyundai, Samsung. Okay. South Korea is actually an industrial giant. Okay, and it's a very it's a very successful, very developed uh, economy with high GDP numbers. North Korea, on the other hand, is just a dismal, um, depressing just tragedy. It's really an economic tragedy. Uh, real GDP is estimated here, and I think this might be a generous estimate, at $1,500 per capita, ranking them at the very bottom of the 190 or some odd countries in the world. You can see that they don't have electricity, except for a tiny speck in their capital city, Pyongyang. Uh, even there, the electricity is very unreliable. Okay. People don't own their own houses. People don't have electricity. They don't have appliances. Uh, oftentimes, they don't even have enough basic food. They have problems with malnutrition. North Korea ranks near the bottom of many of these uh, human development indicators like life expectancy, okay. uh, basic nutrition, okay, basic health care services. The communist government simply, even if it wanted to, again, even if it wanted to, presuming these communist dictators really mean well, and we know better than that because with David Hume, we're assuming all men are knaves. But even if they did mean well, they have no means to provide much wealth because they just are stuck as far as the incentives go and the information to develop the productive supply mechanism. So, and I'll, I'll let you read more about North and South Korea. In fact, I'm also going to post a, um, a very interesting documentary that compares the life across the two countries and get more of a feel for it. It's actually very sad and very disturbing. Um, the way things happen in North Korea, as I mentioned, the workers are slaves, they have no freedom, um, starvation is common. Okay. These are all the symptoms that come with just basically shutting markets down uh, completely. They completely shut down the function, the functioning of the market and entrepreneurship, and not surprisingly, they have dismal economic results. Whereas South Korea, on the other hand, and does South Korea have problems with cronyism and monopoly uh, privileges and things of that nature? Of course. All, all economies are going to have that. All economies are going to have political problems. But by and large, they have a private property, private ownership, market-based uh, mechanism. They have a sound institutional framework, and their, their people live well. They have prosperity. Okay. So that's basically what it boils down to. Now, when I ask you what is the most important institutional difference between these countries, well... It comes back to the defining characteristic of the market economy, which is based on property rights. And when you have individual ownership of land, labor, and capital, you get everything else in sequence. Okay? Trade prices, profit, and loss, and the feedback mechanism. Versus a socialist economy where you outlaw private ownership, and therefore you outlaw trade, you outlaw prices, you outlaw profit and loss accounting, you eliminate feedback, and therefore you eliminate growth. And the entrepreneurs can't function for two reasons. Here's the entrepreneurs with the eyes, well, the prices aren't there, so the entrepreneurs are blind, for starters. Furthermore, entrepreneurs, business owners, well, they can't own business. They can't own land. They can't own buildings. They can't own vehicles. They can't own inventories. Okay? So entrepreneurship is outlawed as well in this kind of economy. Well, you have no entrepreneurs. You're hopeless. Okay? You have no prices. This is what the, com the pure communist economy has done. This is what... This is what our old friend here, Ludo Granmises, was talking about when he wrote his famous critique of socialism in 1920. And uh, von Mises predicted that the communist nations of the world would not survive very long. Um, Soviet Union, the biggest uh, pure communist nation in the world, did limp along for several uh, decades, actually, 
mostly because it had some natural resources it could sell to the rest of the world so it could to some extent participate in international markets but when the soviet union ultimately collapsed um, uh, by the weight of its own inefficiencies um, economists who had been schooled in this line of thinking were not surprised at all in fact they were surprised that it took so long for these economies to fail okay so i'll wrap up the point on private property uh, you'll notice i'll talk more about property rights than anything else because it is the most important it is the central institution it is the key thing that you need to have private property is the foundation of a highly productive modern economy okay so when we ask the further question of what institutions promote growth we should really we really want to think in terms of what institutions promote secure property rights for and remember it's not just for land it's not just land ownership it's land labor and capital the the freedom and the ability to buy and sell physical property whether that's land buildings vehicles office supplies okay capital equipment tools machinery computers or labor okay yourself self ownership and the freedom of labor to say yes or no to various um, prospective employment what institutions promote that security and all kinds of property rights then if we have that we'll have smoothly functioning markets we'll have incentives in place for capital accumulation and technological innovation okay, so to round out our discussion of institutions we're looking at things that promote secure property rights and therefore sound economic incentives one of the most important things uh, to look at is to have a functional government the ultimate function of government in a market economy is to secure property rights okay, to protect and def and um, to protect people's property person and property against um, against harm by others and to secure the transfer of property through a legal system okay. you want that to function well you want it to do its job without corruption corruption I've got this definition here from Wikipedia the use of power by government officials for illegitimate private gain corruption is very bad for growth Okay. It's, it's bad in general, but specifically it's bad for economic growth. Why? Well, think about if you have a lot of corrupt officials, and if corrupt officials, most importantly, if corrupt officials can get away with the corruption, okay, things like taking bribes, um, things like political payoffs, things like um, being able to buy off the right government officials to quash your competitors, for instance, We'll, we'll see that this will naturally stifle entrepreneurship and investment. Okay. Corrupt government officials, you want to think about it in terms of who are they going to go after. Okay. They're going to go after the people with money, okay. the people with high incomes, people with wealth. In a market economy, who are those people going to be? Okay. Uh, if you look in the U.S., if you look at statistics in the U.S., it's something around 80% of millionaires are first generation millionaires in other words they didn't inherit their wealth the vast majority of people who get rich in America they didn't inherit it if they didn't inherit it where did they get it from they got it from being entrepreneurs and building up businesses providing lots of value to other consumers in the economy okay. well government officials want to go after the people with the most money because that's where the money is if government if corrupt officials can get away with bribery get away with accepting bribes and that becomes a, a normal practice if that becomes an accepted practice Okay. Not only are they going to chase away the entrepreneurs, because the entrepreneurs will take their money and leave, so to speak, but what we'll call political plunder here will become a, um, a path to success rather than work and investment in building businesses and, and innovating in the marketplace. Okay. And if you, in this kind of economy, you'll see that the situation winds up being that the political elites... Okay, the people with the political power have all the wealth. The total wealth is going to be very low, and the political elites are going to have all of it. And would-be entrepreneurs either can't get started, or if they can get a start at all, they will quickly want to leave. They want to take their capital and leave for an economy that will respect their property and treat them better, for an economy like the United States, for instance. The United States has, done, has attracted entrepreneurs from all over the world for that very reason that our government tends to function relatively well okay relatively well in terms of um, protecting recognizing property rights enforcing contracts and generally being guided by the rule of law rather than the rule of individual political elites now I know a lot of you are thinking oh professor Watts you're crazy our our government is totally corrupt there's all kinds of 
uh, terrible politicians doing terrible things left and right. Well, yeah, all governments are corrupt. Um, you know, David Hume's concept that assume all men are knaves kind of implies that all people are corrupt at some level. But the question is, it's not, are, are people corrupt? The question is, can you get away with it? Is it common? Okay, is it more common or is it more rare? I would suggest to you that in the U.S., corruption, getting away with it, is more rare. Okay, Politicians all might be at heart uh, liars and thieves, but the fact is it's tougher to get away with it so we can minimize the effect of corruption in the U.S. Here's, a, here's one of my favorite examples. I don't know if you remember this guy, Blago, former governor of Illinois here, who uh, had a very famous uh, corruption case wherein he tried to uh, sell off the Senate seat that was uh, vacated by Senator Obama when he became President Obama in 2009. And Blagojevich had the privilege as governor of appointing an interim senator, and he said, well, I'm going to get my money's worth for that. Well, he got caught. He's uh, in jail now. I would suggest to you that in America, corruption is quite a bit harder to get away with than in other countries. Now, uh, we can empirically actually illustrate this, and this is a picture from the book, by looking at uh, countries' rankings on a corruption index. Okay. And the corruption index takes a lot of different factors into account. It takes the incidence of bribery into account and other things like that. Um, and the higher your score on the index, the more corrupt you are, the lower your score. It goes from minus 2.5 to positive 2.5. Okay, the lower the score, the less corrupt you are. Okay. Well, look, the U.S. ranking up here with the, in the group of the least corrupt countries. Okay. So we've got some corrupt, we've got some bad apples here and there. We tend to prune them out. Okay. And we're in here. I don't know what's going on with Scandinavia. Maybe we need to study their uh, cultural DNA. All the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Iceland, Finland, Sweden, uh, are up here. Okay. And some of the Anglo countries, New Zealand, uh, U.S. Okay. We've got something going on in our institutional and cultural DNA, I would suggest, wherein... We can limit the effects of bad apples, and we can limit corruption. And compare that to our GDP per capita. Now, this is an older number. That's why the number is lower here. It's currently 50,000, but this is a little bit older data set. Um, you can see the correlation is very strong. Lower corruption places have high GDP per capita, which means they've had economic growth at work for a long period of time. The more corrupt places in the world, uh, there, there's North Korea, just a totally corrupt, totally evil dictatorship. Um, some of the uh, sub-Saharan African countries are beset by corruption. Haiti, some of the Caribbean and South American countries. Um, corruption reigns supreme here, and not surprisingly, their GDP per capita is down here at a very abysmal level. Okay. So corruption, the effect of having, um, basically, the way to interpret this is that these countries have a more or less functional government when it comes to protecting property rights and contract and having a rules-based system. So we have functional government up here, and down here we have dysfunctional governments. Okay. So you want to have a functional government, and the main function is to secure property. Another aspect of this is you want political stability. Yeah. Unstable political environment creates uncertainty. Uncertainty as to the as to your ability as an entrepreneur, as a resource owner, to profit over the long run from investing in capital. Okay. If you're uncertain as if a political if a different regime, for instance, uh, takes over and they decide to expropriate the capitalists, well are you going to make an investment in a factory or an oil refinery? Are you going to improve your land? Are you going to make an investment that pays off over a 10 or 20 or 50 year span if you're not sure who's going to be in power next year and if it's the other tribe that you're not a member of and they're going to kill you and steal your property are you going to make those investments no okay but if you know that whoever is in power they can't just take your property they can't just raise taxes um, without a political process if you know that power can be transitioned peacefully and your property will remain secure, then you can undertake those investments. Well, this is one of the things that the U.S. really has going for us. Okay? War, revolution, political unrest is very uncommon. Now there's occasional riot, there's a, a, a frequent protest, but um, generally property rights remain secure, and when we have a transfer of power from one political party to another, 
it's done remarkably peacefully. This is one really one of the truly great things about the United States political system. Regardless of your political um, sensibilities, your political loyalties, or you might not have any, uh, one thing you, you have to remark on as being nice about our system is that power transitions peacefully at every election and property remains generally secure. In fact, I would suggest that you know we have a sign at the border when you drive into the U.S. It says, welcome to the U.S., 150 years without a civil war. Hey, that's a pretty impressive track record, especially when you compare it to other parts of the world that are in constant turmoil, and consequently there's very little investment happening in these countries. Okay. One, uh, one more thing we will look at that's kind of uh, an aspect of this fundamental role of having this uh, functional government protecting property rights is a dependable legal system. We want a functional legal system. The legal system really is what I would call the locus. It's the place where property rights are defined and enforced and recognized in the economy. And you have to have a functional legal system to have security of property. So ultimately, who defends you against invasion or appropriation of your property? Well, it's the police. It's the, it's the courts. Okay? If you violate my property, if you steal my car, if you try to steal my car, or if you try to break into my house, um, I'm a big believer in self-help. I'm a big believer in do-it-yourself. Um, so I might not even need to, to resort to the legal system. Um, in fact, I have a sign out in my garage. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so some of us are more kind of hands-on do-it-yourself. Um, others of us, and ultimately, what's our ultimate line of defense? Well, it's to call the police and say, hey, somebody's trying to steal my stuff, trying to, someone's violating my property, come get them, okay? And the police will come get them, we'll take them to court, we'll have the hearing, and if we find them guilty of violating your property, uh, they're either going to be forced to pay you back, they might go to jail if they're deemed to be dangerous. Okay? So the legal system is critical there because it's kind of the last line of defense um, to secure property, to transfer property. When we sell property, um, it's recorded in the county courthouse, and that's a reliable mechanism. Everybody knows who owns what, uh, who owes what. Okay. That's a, a mechanism we can all rely on. It works very well. It's actually probably one of the best features of the U.S. legal system relative to the rest of the world is our um, titling and, and recording system of property. It is very functional. Okay. And enforcement of contracts like um, financing contracts um, to borrow money and pay it back over time. Um, these all require complex legal arrangements and a, a functional court system corporate arrangements, um, corporate finance arrangements that might necessitate bankruptcy proceedings. Well, you have to have a, a well-functioning legal system for people to buy into those kind of contracts. Labor contracts. We'll talk a lot about labor contracts in the in the next unit. Um, these also de depend on a well-functioning legal system to define the rights of workers, the rights of employers, uh, to basically structure the setting where Businesses can fairly easily and straightforwardly hire and fire workers. One of the most important resources is the labor resource. So in brief, you need a, uh, a dependable, functional legal system to have a market economy. I wanted to share a little insight on the importance of a legal system from just one of the greats of modern um, cartoon literature. <laughs> Cool glasses! Can I try them on? Oh! SpongeBob, your eye! It's all black and swollen! How'd you mess your eye up, SpongeBob? Did somebody hit you? Where is he? Yeah, we'll, we'll settle this like men! We'll sue him! Of course, Patrick doesn't realize it, but he's actually right. The civilized way to resolve disputes is through the legal system rather than through personal violence. Okay? Using personal violence and uh, vigilante retribution and that kind of stuff, that's what um, not very well-developed, kind of more primitive societies do, using the legal system and a clearly defined, agreed-upon legal procedures. That's what civilized economies do, and that's that contributes to the security of property, that contributes to an overall environment of peaceful interaction, and that contributes to a positive environment for economic growth, for capital formation, for innovation. Okay. So we are really interested in having a well-functioning legal system that people have access to that's impartial. Okay. All these things, we could go on and on, and we could actually talk about um, the legal aspects of economic development for the whole semester. But this is just a little tiny sampler of why the legal system is important. 
Okay, finally, let's wrap up our, our brief discussion here kind of on an institutional overview by thinking about one very important thing that hopefully you uh, talked a lot about in your micro class, which is having competitive and open markets. Okay. Remember from micro. Oh, no, I'm going to take you back to micro. Well, this is a, probably the most important thing you learned there. In long run equilibrium, competitive markets, economic profit equals zero economic profit equals zero. Now can firms still get a return on their capital? Yes, but what this means is they can't get above the normal return. Okay, And in a real equilibrium in which there was no changes in uh, technology or preferences, um, all returns would just equal a the natural rate of interest. Okay, So nobody's really earning profits in a long-run equilibrium. Of course the the problem with this is we never really arrive at equilibrium because preferences and technologies are constantly changing, but it's a useful thought construct. Okay, Profit, the the real world implication of this is that profits tend to be competed away. Okay. And uh, you probably thought you'd never have to deal with this again, did you? Well, this is an important tool from Micro. And let me just remind you briefly by going back to the cost curves concept. Uh, here's your average total cost, and your, you might remember your marginal cost curve intersects your average cost curve at its minimum. Okay. And that means we have total market efficiency. Also, the average cost curve and marginal cost curve are going to be driven down through competitive forces until where the minimum average total cost is just equal to price. So we have profit equals zero in competitive long run equilibrium, pi is for profit, and cost equals price. Okay. What are the implications of this? And if, if you don't remember why, well just remember that if the price of this good was up here, producers produce where marginal cost equals price where marginal revenue equals price in this kind of market setting that means there's profit that means there's this much profit for producers and what are other entrepreneurs or other capitalists or other investors going to do if they see that there's this much profit being earned in this industry industry X we don't care whatever industry it is if there's profit being earned by some firms in this industry, other entrepreneurs are going to step into this industry, and what are they going to do? Well, the entry of new suppliers pushes the cost curves down, and we'll eventually see the price competed back down to where it's just equal to cost, which is a condition of longer and equilibrium. Okay. So profits get competed away. There's your micro-review. The implication and uh, profit equals zero, and, and also of equal importance is that Cost, cost equals price, which means we have the most efficient provision of this good possible. We've minimized the cost, in other words. Um, what that means is all surplus is consumer surplus. And I don't know about you, but that makes me pretty happy because I'm a consumer, you're a consumer. Heck, we're all consumers. Okay? So we should be really thrilled at this aspect of uh, market competition. All surplus goes to the consumers in competitive situation. The key word here is competition. And what does that mean? That means, well, there's no legal barriers to entry for any resources, land, labor, and capital to enter into the production of any goods. Okay. So if you think that there's profits to be made in a certain industry, and how do you know that? Well, you know that from reading the market. You know that from paying attention to prices, from knowing the conditions in that market. You organize the land, labor, and capital and enter into that market. If you want to, you can. There's nothing. There's no legal barrier stopping you. Now, of course, you have to have the financing. You have to have access to the resources. You have to know how to make the deals. Okay. There's no legal barriers. In other words, there's no legalized monopolies in the economy. Okay. Now, we do have some monopolies in our economy. We, we're beset with different monopoly um, problems in different sectors of the economy. But relative to the rest of the world, we do tend to minimize monopoly uh, or non-competitive market conditions. Poor economies, on the other hand, a lot of them tend to be dominated by monopolies or lack of market access for potential entrepreneurs. And you'll see a whole lot of details if you uh, do the Unit 2 Extra Credit Assignment, which I strongly encourage you to do. You'll, you can read about um, some examples of this in the, um, the book chapter from the um, book I referenced earlier, which is uh, Why Nations Fail. Okay, so to sum up, institutions matter. Institutions govern the incentives facing entrepreneurs. Okay. Property rights is the most important. It's the core institutional structure in the economy. Without property rights, individual ownership, you basically have no markets, you have no feedback, you have no guidance for entrepreneurs and resource owners. With secure property rights, which also entails a, an honest government, minimizing corruption in a functional legal system and uh, a stable political environment, 
in competitive markets with all of those elements more or less in place okay and again we could go into each one of these things and talk about it for the whole semester but if these are more or less in place okay you have some basic environment in which entrepreneurs can can thrive uh, the property is secure they have incentives to invest in capital they in have incentives to engage in reliable dealings over the long run um, and you're going to see economic growth generated as a result of that so what we'll do from here on out okay knowing that the institutional foundation is of utmost importance well we'll take for granted that that it's in place and we can kind of look at the mechanics of growth with the solo model and how capital the role that capital plays and the limits of capital and then the role of technology in long-term economic growth that explains what we observe for a 200-year period in an economy like the US economy chugging along at average long-run growth rates of real GDP at 3% and bringing us to the situation we're in now of basically as I mentioned the wealthiest generation that has ever lived on the planet so we'll get into that next mechanics of growth with the solo model uh, we're getting pretty close to being wrapped up with uh, unit 2 stay tuned sit tight and uh, see you next time we'll learn some more econ